You're listening to Witch Wednesdays, a semi-weekly podcast source for all things witchcraft in the modern world. Join your host, Steph, on Wednesday mornings to chat about seasons, Sabbaths, and all new witchcraft topics to help you make your life more magical. Welcome back to Witch Wednesdays. I'm Steph, and I have a guest author here with me today, among all of the other things um, that she does. But before we dive into all of that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to her so she can introduce herself and let you know where you can find her online. Hello. So my name is Anlin Avalon. Um, I am a water priestess and Celtic witch. Um, You can find me on Instagram under Anlin Avalon. It's just like my name is spelled A-N-N-W-Y-N Avalon. Um, You can also find me on YouTube, um, Facebook, and threads, I believe all under Anlin Avalon. Um, My websites are waterwitchcraft.com, waterpriestess.com, and then of course you can find everything about me um, over at anlinavalon.com. I was going to say, you know, to find everything about you, you have quite a history in in witchcraft as it relates to water, a Celtic background. I'm like so impressed with everything that you have been able to do and study because it is quite a long list. <laughs> it is. It, it It is. It's gotten to the point where it's a bit enormous and I have to start picking and choosing like what I actually want to be on there. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, but my path of magic has been has been just quite diverse and amazing and lovely. But you know, it's it's gone through dance, um, it's gone through fine art, um, through writing, blogging, um, YouTube videos. I mean, just so many different things. But the one thing that always connects my work is water. Which is so interesting to me because I am a water sun sign, but I am also landlocked. And I mean, we do have a giant lake here, but I have read multiple of your books at this point, but your water witchcraft book was really great because it opened so many doors of like, even though you're landlocked and you can't, it would take forever to get to an ocean or a beach of like all of the different things that you can do and experience, even if you don't have that by you, which was just mind-blowing to me totally eye-opening I started actually teaching so so I had been connecting with and, and doing a lot of my solitary work and such for years but I started actually teaching about water magic when I was living in Arizona and I had just gotten there I had just come from living on the coast in North Carolina to the desert and I really thought that there was no water like I was gonna die um there was like a land made uh, sorry a man-made lake um and I was like you know that's just not gonna cut it for me I don't want some you know pond that somebody is dug and filled with rainwater um but the, the truth of the matter is there's actually water everywhere even in Arizona I started like really like diving deep and being like where can I find water in the desert and Tucson Arizona has waterfalls um there's a hot springs right outside of Phoenix Arizona um about two and a half hours north of Phoenix is a place called Sedona which I'm sure many of you have heard about there are sacred wells there are sacred springs there are uh, creeks and rivers um Cottonwoods not too far from there as well also has a ton of water Flagstaff also has a lot of water. Um, of course, they were in northern Arizona, which isn't so deserty. But even um, in there's there's a river that runs right through Arizona, like right through Phoenix and that area, the outskirts of it. Um, so there's water everywhere. So you know, for people that are landlocked, um, I encourage you to dive a little deeper because even in Arizona there was water um but I also understand because going from living next to the ocean to the desert is was so hard it was so hard um but you know 
we can use the water in our tap, in our bathtub, um, you know, to, to create magic. So there's so many ways to connect with water. I, I'm so excited that you said Arizona. I was like, that's even less water than here, than it's here in Chicago, um, which is absolutely amazing. So I love that you offered that resource and have begun teaching about that uh, because it's obviously one of my favorite elements to work with. I tend to favor water witchcraft. Um, so I love that that resource exists because I know that some people kind of struggle with that. So thank you for providing that. Of course, my pleasure. And how did all of your work and history lead you into studying more of Celtic background? And specifically, how did you incorporate all of the Celtic goddesses? Because I would love to talk about your other book. Yes, my newest book that just yes. came up. <laughs> very very exciting and another one that I learned so much from because I, I think there's like a lot of emphasis on particular Celtic goddesses and I I learned so many new names just from reading this book I was like I didn't even know these existed well there's so many and I'm I I know that I missed some like when I when I first started writing the book I was like I will have every Celtic goddess ever in this book and I I it was impossible to put them all in there. So I know that I've even missed some, but, um, oh my gosh. All right. So to answer your question, how did I get started on the Celtic path and with Celtic goddesses? Well, <laughs> it's a long story, but, um, the, the very, very short version, I'll try to keep it short here is, um, so my mother was born, uh, here in England and, um, moved to the U S um when she was uh in her late teens early 20s and um so I was born with UK citizenship with English uh citizenship um but when, when we were growing up we would come over um not every summer but some summers and it was always so important to me it was like it was such a big thing and it was so impactful um and I just, I just really would connect with all of these places. Like for example, um, Sulis's temple at Bath. Um, I went there when I was five and then again, when I was like 12 and then 16 and over and over and over again. Um, and then, you know, into my adulthood, I kept going back. So I, it was like this place that, that I would pilgrimage to, even though at the time I, I wasn't calling it a pilgrimage. It was like family vacation. Um, and then there's other other goddesses in the book um, that started coming to me later on when I first started um, working, you know, with uh, when I when I first started my magical practice, I started working with bodies of water. I started working with spirits um, and almost all of the spirits that came through were either watery or had some sort of like Celtic connection. As I got like older, I went going through my, you know, teen years into my early 20s, I became obsessed with like all things Celtic, medieval. Um, I got into some reenactment in my like really early um late teens, early 20s. I was into some some of the reenactment stuff. Um, and I just I just was so obsessed with it. It was like this like this drive. Um and I, I would draw these spirals and these triscals and these triquetras over and over and over again until finally I really did like actually start researching and learning what all of this was and everything brought me back to my, you know, connection to the British Isles and to, you know, the my family's connection, my, my ancestry. Um, not that that really, you know, makes a difference for other folks. Like you don't have to, you know, have been, your mother doesn't have to have been born in the UK to work with a Celtic, Celtic goddess. Um, but for me, like that was a big driving point. It, it just was, it was part of who I was and I wanted to know, to know that. Um, I did have some in the early days, some of the Greek goddesses did come in. Um, 
and and some of the Roman like Greek slash Roman goddesses did come in, um, Aphrodite and and Persephone and such. And I I did work with them, and I still honor them, um, but not in the same way that I work with and honor some of the Celtic goddesses. Um, but there's also an interesting connection with the Romans and the Celts because the Romans were the colonizers of the Celts. Um, they came over and they, you know, um, built their temples on all the sacred sites, um, both destroying and preserving a lot of the um, Celtic, uh, Celtic ways. And um, then after that, it was the Christian occupation that, again, they built their churches on the sacred sites and also destroyed and, and helped to preserve some of these older practices. I really started getting into folklore around sacred wells and springs and um, some of the practices around um, different bodies of water, like rivers and lakes. Um, and what I kept finding was that every single body of water had a connection to a spirit or a goddess or a saint. And then that saint would have a connection to a goddess. Um, and when I wrote Water Witchcraft, it... Um, it was a bit broader and then it it was really narrowed down into you know celtic water like folk magic around water um and you'll see some of the goddesses in there but when i wrote that book i it was my first book and it was huge it was like twice maybe three times the size of what got published um and so i had to kind of split it up and chunk things out and so about 30,000 words went into the my second book which is the way of the water priestess um and then i had big chunks and swaths of leftover goddesses um that just didn't make it in like sulis made it into water witchcraft and so did melusine and so did the lake lady but in a smaller way, like in a much smaller capacity. Um, and so I got to work on this third book um, and start putting the goddesses, you know, expanding them and talking about them in a greater capacity. Um, and then, like you had mentioned just a little while ago, um, that, you know, that there was obscure goddesses and goddesses that you've never heard of. So when you're writing a book on Celtic goddesses, it, you, it takes you on a really deep dive and you, you start out with the ones that you think, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, it, it just kept getting deeper and deeper. And then I found that I needed three times as many, you know, words to write the Celtic goddess grimoire as what actually got published. Um, so there's a lot that got, cut out as well because there's so much information but what did get included is all the really good stuff I made sure that that was you know it was it was nice and all, all the it really important good stuff got in there but then I also had to make hard decisions because um you know there are tons of books on the Morrigan there are tons of books on Bridget there's several books on Caridwin um and you cannot write a book about Celtic goddesses and and not include those goddesses that would be ridiculous but at the same time there's multiple volumes that multiple authors have written about these goddesses and so I really wanted to make sure that they were included but I also wanted some of these more obscure goddesses that don't have full books on them or may never have full books on them um to kind of have be, be highlighted and shown um you know Sh shine a light on them and to to really say like hey there's there's a lot more um so Coventina um gets a little bit and Arnamenti uh Arnamentia she also gets um uh, a big chunk and Nematona and Rose Myrta and some of these other goddesses that are just not as well known but they had uh, a, a huge following in the ancient world and they were worshipped in many locations because we keep finding the artifacts we keep finding them in the archaeological record um and then of course water plays a huge part in this book as well too because 
the Celtic goddesses are deeply connected to water. Many of them are named for rivers or the rivers are named for them. Many of them are connected with holy wells or the ocean or, um, you know, particular lakes. Um, like Caridwyn is connected with Lake Bala and the Lady of Llyny Fenfach or the Lake Lady is connected with Llyny Fenfach. Um, and... Uh, you know, even Rhiannon has a connection uh, with water, which comes from Adair Rhiannon, which are Rhiannon's birds, which are located out in the ocean. Um, I believe the only goddess that didn't have a connection to water that I could find was Andraste. And the reason for that is because all that we know about Andraste comes from what we know about Boudicca and Queen Boudicca and what we know about Queen Boudicca comes from the letters home to Rome. So what the Romans were writing uh, back or the Roman generals and such were writing back to Caesar. Um, and so there's, that's all we have. So Andraste might have been connected with a body of water, um, but we'll never know because we've lost that information um i'm trying to think if there's any other goddesses that weren't connected like um the even goddesses that you wouldn't think are connected with water are somehow connected with water like um uh blood eye with like for the longest time i was like oh obviously she's a flower goddess not a water goddess but there is a, a part in her story where a river, she she has to, you know, a river takes place, um, sorry, a river comes up twice in her story um, and some of the pivotal moments in her story take place at these rivers. Um, so I was, I was a little shocked about that and was like, oh, there's more water. Um, so lots of water. Uh, water led the way on this one um and uh yeah yeah I'll pause there I I think I've side quested twice from the question that you asked me so I I love the side questing because it just connects your story so beautifully of how the dive into the goddesses actually happened uh and I love that so many of them are connected to water in that way and it's part of what I learned so much through your book and something specifically that I loved was like the breadth of information that was in there because I am completely in love with history and the folklore and the mythology and where all of that comes from. Because I think in modern day witchcraft, we know that so much of what we know and do was influenced by Wicca, which was heavily influenced by UK based sort of witchcraft and a lot of Celtic beliefs and systems. So I just loved reading through that and like getting to know all of that history and I can't imagine how much you must have researched for this and also how much you had to cut out. I'm like, I just want more. I want a bigger book. Oh, I know. I would have, I would love to have, have you know, uh, written a bigger book. And and I've kind of joked a little bit around, you know, maybe, maybe there will be a, a number two, but this book was so hard to write. My first book was really hard to write. I'm not going to lie. Cause it was my first one and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but and the, my second book, the way the water priestess it flew right out of me no problem but Celtic goddess grimoire was so difficult because I wanted to just put so much information about each of the goddesses in there but unfortunately there isn't an equal amount of information about them and it's really disproportionate so for example we have the Welsh goddesses like Rhiannon, um, Blood Eye with and Arian Road that get full stories in the Mabinogi. Same with the Lake Lady and Caridwen, like they're full stories and some of the Irish goddesses as well. They get these big, long sagas, which tell us so much about them. And then you have goddesses like Arnamentia and Sulis and Coventina and Rosmerta and Epona that there's no stories 
zero stories, zero text that talks about them. There's no fragments of their story or their legend. But what we do have is a massive amount of archaeological evidence. So Sulis, of course. So I have a deep connection with Sulis. Well, let, let's talk about her a little bit. Um, <laughs> like Sulis is... Excellent, let's is, do it. <laughs> uh, she's, she's like a perfect example of one of these goddesses that has a massive amount of archaeological evidence for her existence and her worship across multiple different like cultures and times but zero stories there's one legend that does talk about Sulis I didn't put this in the book because um again space um but it doesn't really talk about Sulis as a goddess it only talks about the water and it's about King Blood and he had leprosy and he went and like saw these pigs kind of rolling around in the mud near the sacred spring that was bubbling up. And he decided he would do the same and then it, his leprosy was cured. So again, we have a story about the site, but not about the goddess. So then we get... um you know, fast forward to the Regency Georgian Victorian periods where they are starting to do all of these excavations and archaeological digs and it's it's fancy and all of the aristocrats are going to Bath to take the waters. Well, during this period when, the, you know, all the aristocrats are going and taking the waters, this is, this is still using her sacred waters for therapeutic reasons, for healing. But they start digging and they start finding all of these Roman artifacts. And now what we have is a almost fully excavated temple um, about 22 miles north of where I'm at right now um, in, a, in a place called Bath um, here in England. And it is this huge temple complex. It's, they've turned it into a museum. You can go in there and spend half a day just walking through, looking at all of the artifacts, looking at the offerings that were given to her, looking at all of these um, cursed tablets that were placed in the water, looking at the altar stones that were dedicated to her and other stones that have her name written on them, um, giving us this evidence and saying like, look, this goddess was really, really important, not only to the Romans, but to the Celts as well, because of course the Celts were worshiping Sulis at this site long before the Romans showed up. When the Romans did show up, they built this gigantic temple complex, um, which, I mean, the Romans built a lot of things and they did build a lot of big things, but to have a huge temple complex for a Celtic goddess is a bit odd. It's it's just slightly out of place. It's true that they would come um, into new areas and that they would like find the local deities and kind of be like, oh, like that that goddess is kind of like Diana. So we're going to call her Diana or this one. This one is kind of like Minerva. So we're going to call her Minerva. But with Sulis, what they did is the Romans showed up and she was so sacred and so powerful and so important to the Romans that they decided not only to not rename her and let her keep her name, Sulis, but they so they tacked Minerva onto the end, so Sulis Minerva. But then they built this gigantic temple complex to her. Um, and we have like no stories we don't know what Sulis's origin story was we can look at her name and learn that it's possible that she has connections to the sun or connections to eye like an eye or the eye of the sun um, we know that she's a hot spring goddess with her thermal waters bubbling up and is a healing it's not only is it a healing spring for the Celts and the Romans but it was for the later um 
aristocrats and it still is today because you can actually go to bath and you can go to a place called therme spa which is like a modern day spa experience but they've taken the water from the uh from the spring and they've pumped it into this modern spa experience we can go and get you know do steam rooms and um you know floating pools and and all sorts of stuff so her worship has been for thousands of years across so many different um occupations and of of the celtic lands um even to the point where there's a beautiful cathedral built on top of where the romans where the roman baths were so it you know the celts worshipped first then it was the romans then you know this beautiful cathedral is built on top of that then it continues with the aristocrats coming to to drink the water to heal but we also know then from her artifacts and from what's found in the temple that she wasn't just a goddess of healing but she's a goddess of cursing and of justice um and there was about 150 curse tablets found in the archaeological digs and who knows maybe we'll find some more um but it was you know such and such has stolen my tunic please or or great goddess Sulis, i implore you to you know never let them sleep until it's been returned <laughs> um and 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 things like this and um so it's it's so fascinating um i had i had a pretty profound experience with her in 2018 um when i was there in bath and um since then i i call her my goddess she is my goddess i have i've always worked with and honored the divine feminine but she is number one it is amazing what beautiful history to have and to be near and i have multiple follow up <laughs> In comments. Um, but first follow-up comment that I wanted to say, uh, in addition to all this like beautiful history, you are very detailed in the book with having exercises for people that are just getting started and might be overwhelmed by all the names that you've given so far in this episode. And I just want to say that your book is incredibly helpful. You have an exercise of starting and finding a goddess to work with. So I just want people to know that that information is also in your book. So you do not have to know any of this before you start reading. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, you start and you end with the same vision journey um, or visualization or, or meditation where you go into the standing stones um, and you look into a scrying pool and she comes to you and a, a goddess comes to you in that in the very beginning before you open the you know before you get into the chapters about the goddesses and you're supposed to take notes of like what does she look like what does she say to you like what is in the background what do her clothes look like what kind of energy does she have so that the goddess that might be wanting to work with you or that has been tapping your shoulder for years and years or patiently waiting silently for you to notice uh, comes to you and then you read the rest of the book and hopefully she's revealed and then you visit the standing stones again at the very end you go the end you go back to the beginning um and you you kind of can redo the vision um and and see if things change or if it becomes more clear for you. Um, so, yeah, because I have a great exercise and you have a lot of, you have multiple exercises throughout the book that would be helpful and, you know, ideas for getting started. So you don't have to know any of this because I was like a lot of, I think, beginner readers where I was familiar with Bridget Kerrigan and the Morgan, just like you said. And I, beyond that, I just did not have that in for much information. And I feel like I learned so much without getting overwhelmed. Right. Well, and it can be, it can be super overwhelming. And see, I was not the type of, I, I would, I would always envy like the Bridget devotees or the Morgan devotees because the goddesses would come to them and it was so clear that who it was that is obviously the morgan that came to you in a dream that is obviously bridget that came to you in your meditation and it was so easy 
but the the goddesses and the spirits that were coming to me weren't that I, I, I couldn't just open up you know google and uh, maybe at, the, at that time i don't even know if google was around in the same capacity but you know i couldn't just open up the internet or a book and be like oh boom that's who it is it was obscure goddesses like sulis or like the lake lady from the mabinogi because i had lake ladies coming to me but they were not the arthurian sword wielding um or sword handing out um lake ladies they were something different they were very uh watery very fairy woman like which yes of course the the arthurian lady is is a fairy woman as well but you'd expect a lake lady to be handing you a sword and mine were swordless and so that gave me a clue that they were different um or the two-tailed mermaids that kept showing up and and again like that is super weird because mermaids usually don't have two tails um until i started really diving deep and trying to figure out what are these spirits that keep coming to me um and so there's others out there like that as well that you know you might have a spirit come to you or a goddess come to you and you're just like I have no idea who you are. Or they might tell you their name. Um, Arnementier was one that came to me and told me who her name was. Like, she told me her name. And I think that when, at that time, I think uh, this was probably the early 2000s, there wasn't a Wikipedia page on her. Um, you know, I had no idea who she was. There was nothing I could find. So it was partially like my quest to find out who they were that helped to to uh, lay the foundation for the book. And I'm glad that you wrote it because now I have some place to check in like myself and, and look all this up because you're right. This, this is not a, a place uh, on the internet for this information where you can readily find a lot of these smaller goddesses. So I'm glad that this exists. And the other follow-up, I guess it's just about your life, um, but you mentioned, you know, it being 20 minutes north of where you are and Sacred Springs. And I would love for you to let the listeners know where it is actually that you live and what you do, <laughs> besides being an author and sharing all of this great information. <laughs> So um, if we had done this interview way back in 2021, it would be a very different tale to tell. But uh, it is now 2024. How time flies. Oh. Um, <laughs> and uh, I moved from the U.S. to Glastonbury, England, um, about a year and a half ago, um, fall of 2022 um is yes the fall of 2022 november of 2022 i had to think about it for a second um i moved uh very fast it was a very fast move um to glastonbury and so i live uh now in glastonbury at the base of the tour um across from the chalice well next to the white spring um and some of the listeners may have heard of the famous occultist from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s named Dion Fortune. Um, she wrote Moon Magic and The Sea Priestess and um, books on the Kabbalah and Glastonbury of the Heart. She was quite a prolific writer and um, very, very famous in some circles. Um, and I... Uh, purchased the cottage that used to be hers here in Glastonbury and I'm restoring it. I also am a uh, what we call a keeper which is um, like a volunteer or um, someone on staff. We don't get paid we're volunteers um, and because it's a a community run um, uh, spring. Um, let me back up. <laughs> the White Spring is a free entry, um, volunteer run, interfaith water temple um, with lots of amazing shrines. And I, as soon as I got here, started volunteering here uh, at that spring because I have a long history with it. Um, it has changed my life multiple times. It's where I was told to start teaching about water magic. Um, 
and which is what ended up being the foundation for my first book. It's I was in that spring again on pilgrimage in 2018 when I kind of got the like, you know, fly forward with the way of the water priest as it's time to publish this. Um, and it was also a pivotal moment in the spring of 2022 when I audibly heard in meditation inside the temple that I would be moving to Glastonbury before 2023. Didn't believe it. I thought it was impossible. Um, but as soon as I got here, I was like, the spring has changed my life. Not once, not twice, but three times now. Um, and I would really like to volunteer. And it just started out with, you know, like a couple of hours a week. And then by last summer I was doing two days a week anywhere and and there's two like I was doing two shifts a week plus cleaning it plus um you know uh sabbats and such so I was spending anywhere from 12 to 30 hours a week at the spring and then by the fall um the lead ceremonialist retired and I took over that position and so now I am not only a keeper volunteer but I'm also the lead ceremonialist at the spring and we do the eight sabbats or the wheel of the year um community rituals at the spring um for not just the local community because Glastonbury is and like it is a local community there's a lot of local folks here of course because people live here just like I do but it's also a bigger part of the international community because it's a pilgrimage site so people are coming constantly from everywhere in the world to Glastonbury in order to connect with the sacred springs um, walk the tour um, there's priestess trainings there's esoteric conferences there's like there's so many amazing things that you can do in Glastonbury so um, so anyways I host the rituals for the local and the international community whoever's in town um, uh, visiting and and on their sacred pilgrimage um, so I started my very first ritual at the spring was Samhain of 2023. Um, and um, we have a lovely, I'm going to circle it back to goddesses now, because um, on in bulk, we have a lovely ritual where um, a little girl comes, uh, she trains on how to make uh, fire from straw and flint. And so she comes that morning dressed up as the embodiment of the maiden form of Bridget, which we call Bridie. And on in bulk morning, she goes into the courtyard garden and about 200 people pack inside of this old well house. And we black it out so that there's not a pin prick of light shining through. And while we're all in there, in the dark womb of the mother, meditating and being really uncomfortable, um, she is out in the courtyard as the embodiment of the goddess, and she creates a flame from flint and straw. And she carries that in to the temple. She comes to the front doors and she bangs, um, bangs on it, bang, bang, bang. And we fling the doors open and we welcome the goddess in and she parades the flame down where she uh, brings it kind of to where the center pool is. And from that single flame, we light about two to three hundred candles um, and we bring ourselves out of the darkness. Now, what's really amazing about this is that flame is then kept for an entire year it's a yearly perpetual flame and we never have lighters in the spring we never go around with a lighter and light candles we keep that flame two perpetual uh, flames going in the spring one for a backup um, and every time that we go in to light the temple we pull that flame and we light the temple from that flame so every candle that's lit today or yesterday I was on shift yesterday was the flame that was created on February 1st 
Um, we also have a beautiful statue of the maiden form of Bridie, as well as what we call a bower. Um, the bower is like a woven archway tunnel um, that is made once every three years, and it's made out of hazel branches, which is a con deep connection with hazels and the well of wisdom and and um, uh, sacred wells and. So we create, and, and of course, in bulk, because that's when the catkins start to kind of bloom. Um, and so we create this beautiful bower and it's just, people come from all over the world and they tie ribbons and prayers and spells and little dolls that they make and little, you know, little embroidered things and um, like uh, the god dies, which um, are, you know, like you take the two sticks and you make a cross and then you weave the yarn around and around and around until it creates that really beautiful colored like shape that sometimes they call God size. Those are hung in there. Bridie's crosses are made out of rushes. Um, those are hung in there. And really this is a, a an amazing breathtaking Breath take, uh, breath taking away. I mean, it just takes your breath away when you come into the temple for the first time, um, uh, place, and it it transform it transformed my life so many times, and I know that so many others have been transformed by its mystical healing powers. Um, but for those that might be listening, if ever you're in Glastonbury, make sure you come to the White Spring and come into the White Spring Temple. And um, we've got, it, it's just this, this water just flowing through with shrines, not just to Bridie um, or Bridget. We've got the Black Madonna as well as a solar shrine and then the Fairy King of Avalon. Um, but anyways, um, <laughs> it's quite a magical space. So um, I volunteer there and um, yeah. Thank you for sharing. That sounds so beautiful. Yeah, it's it it'll take your breath away for sure. Well, I appreciate you sharing and sharing everything that you do because I think that that is like a really fun and important part of your your story and your history and just where you are now. Um, I think that's amazing. Some place that I always want to visit, but I don't fly, so that that won't happen. Um, but I will I will just live vicariously through you and everything that you share. Yeah, airplanes can be quite harrowing. I will say that now that I'm here, I'm really happy that I don't have to get on one to come here. I'm here <laughs> and I just and you're staying. <laughs> staying. Exactly. Well, thank you so much for being here today and sharing all about your books and your history and your knowledge. I really appreciate you taking the time to chat about everything that we covered today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And listeners, I am going to have everything linked in the show notes as always. So you can check out whichwednesdays.com and find everything that you're looking for, the websites, Instagram, the books, everything that you could possibly want will be linked there. And that's everything that I have for you this week. I will see you in the next one. Need even more witchcraft in your life? Subscribe to Witch Wednesdays on Patreon and YouTube for all types of exclusive bonus content like spells, recipes, book reviews, and more, or even order personalized tarot readings and spells. Be sure to follow on Instagram at Witch Wednesdays Podcast. And you can find all these links and more at witchwednesdays.com. Well,